We continue with our series of messages that we started at the first of the year, Major News from Minor Prophets. And as I've said each week, there are 12 short books of the Old Testament at the very end of the Old Testament. Uh, They're grouped together because of their size. They're not grouped together and called Minor Prophets because they're unimportant. In fact, their message is very powerful and very direct. Uh, And uh, we don't have a lot of information on some of these, uh, who, uh, pro- uh, who wrote these, these letters of prophecy, but we do know that they were speaking on God's behalf to God's people in Old Testament times. There are words of warning and words of encouragement. There's words of promise. There's words uh, of the coming of Messiah all through these 12 short books at the end of your Old Testament. This morning, we're coupling two of them together. And we're not doing that just to try to streamline the series. Uh, there's 12 different uh, books, and if I did one each Sunday, we'd be at this for 12 weeks. That's not the problem. We're streamlining this, or we're putting these two together, because Jonah and Nahum spoke both to the Ninevites. Jonah and Nahum tell us of the mercy and the justice of God. And so this morning we look at both prophets and their prophecies, because they were addressed to the same people. Why would we lump these two together? Well, both were commissioned to speak to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyria and the Assyrian Empire was the empire to which northern, the northern nation of Israel fell. They were taken captive by the Assyrians. And so to these people, uh, God has, has spoken. The entire book of Jonah is, is aimed at the Ninevites and it is a book of mercy. The entire book of Nahum is aimed at the Ninevites, and it is a book of justice. And so I'd like us to just talk, just briefly, just look at a little bit about Jonah this morning and a little bit about Nahum and see how God handles the same people as they respond differently to him. First of all, with Jonah, we find that he was the prophet who experienced God's mercy. Now, in the fall of 2011, just about a year and a half ago, we spent four weeks looking at the book of Jonah. It was, a, it was a series of sermons that I preached from Jonah. And we can learn a lot from this prophet, but we need to open up our hearts and we need to open up our minds. Jonah's story took place sometime between 793 and 753 B.C. In other words, it took place sometime during the period of 750 to 790 years before Christ was born. And there's six things in the book of Jonah, just as a, as a broad review of the, of the story of Jonah that we can talk about. First, we can learn that God is a holy God who hates sin. He is a holy God who hates sin. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2, God is speaking to Jonah. And he says, cry out against Nineveh, against it, against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. For their wickedness has come up before me. God is one who hates sin. God cannot be indifferent to sin. Sometimes we want to see God as a, as a loving and kind God who's always caring for us and always watching for us and is there to bless and, and, and to govern and to, and to guide us in our every need. But God is also a God who cannot deal with sin. He is perfect. And because He is perfect... Because he is sinless, sin has no place in, in, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, dealings with people. He can't be indifferent to it and still be a holy and a righteous God. Some people would think, oh God, you're going to wink at this, aren't you? you? You don't mind if I go ahead and, 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 and kind of uh, go this direction for, for just a little bit. I'll come back to you. Just let me, let me wander away for a while and you'll be good with it. We'll be good, okay? That's not the way God is. God hates sin. He knows all about the evil that we do. God is omnipresent. That means He is present everywhere. God is omniscient. That means He knows all things. And so we have a God who is everywhere and knows all things. He doesn't just know what we do when we physically do something. He knows the inclinations of our hearts. He knows what stirs us up. He knows what's going on in our minds. He knows what we're really thinking when we say something else. He has all knowledge. 
And no one can do wrong without God knowing about it. When we sin, we sin against God, who sees us and knows all about us. He sees us deep down within our hearts, and He knows who we are and what we're really thinking. We're exposed in the presence of God. We can't get away with anything. We may think we can, but when it comes to God, He knows us and He sees us. And God is a holy God who hates sin. Second, let's understand from the book of Jonah that we can learn... I'm sorry... Uh, we can learn that we can that we can run, but we cannot hide from the presence of God. This is exactly what Jonah wanted to do. In Jonah chapter one verse three, it says Jonah rose up and he and he fled to Tarshish, if, and he fled from the presence of the Lord. Why did he do it? Because God had commissioned him to go to the Ninevites and to preach to them and tell them to repent and turn around and come to God. And that was the last thing in the world Jonah wanted the Ninevites to do. God found Jonah and he dealt with Jonah in a very familiar story. Why did Jonah run? Well, the Ninevites were the enemies. The Ninevites were the ones who had been so hard-hearted. They had been the ones that had been condemning and, and uh, uh, carrying uh, uh, all sorts of problems to the nation of Israel. Jonah didn't want to see them come to God. He didn't want to see them repent. He would have preferred to have had the message of Nahum, but instead he had the message of mercy and the message of grace. Well, Jonah ran, and God found him, and God caught up with this rebellious prophet. He was supposed to go to Nineveh, to the capital city of Assyria. Instead, he ran west to the Mediterranean, to the sea coast. And he boarded a vessel and he said, take me as far away from here as you possibly can. He was trying to run away from God, but God caught up with him. He was, uh, he was in this vessel, which started to be completely surrounded by one of the most horrific storms these experienced sailors had ever, ever seen. They had never been in a storm like this. They were throwing cargo off the ship. They were trying to save their very lives. They were praying to all their various gods. And they told Jonah, you pray to your God too. And Jonah said, I can tell you why we're in trouble. It's because of me and it's because I'm running away from God Most High. They were horrified. This man was the cause of their imminent doom. And so they said, pray to him. He said, you, you, you pray for me. And, they, and, and he said, but I'll tell you what can be done. Here's what can be done. Throw me overboard. I'm the one that's causing this problem. Once I'm off your ship, you'll not have any problems. They did everything they possibly could not to do that. They wanted to spare every person's life. But finally, they relented and they said to Jonah's God, forgive us as we do this. And they tossed him overboard. As soon as Jonah went out of the vessel, the sea became calm. And they realized that it was Jonah that was the, the, the root and the problem of, of what they were dealing with. As, as they were struggling with this situation, they found that, uh, they, they, they found that uh, Jonah himself was spared from, uh, from drowning. We know the story. This is where some people know about Jonah, but they don't know anything else about the Bible. They understand God had prepared a fish. And really, the way the story is told these days, it was a big whale. But if you go back to the Scriptures and you look, it was a fish. God prepared the fish for Jonah. As Jonah was sinking down into the depths of the ocean, sure that he was going to be breathing his last, a fish swallowed him whole and kept him intact in his belly for three days. It gave Jonah time to repent. It gave Jonah time to really reconsider what he was doing and who he was running from and why he was doing this. And Jonah experienced a revival. In the, in the belly of this fish, he repented and God caused the fish to throw Jonah back up onto the shore. And the first thing Jonah did was run straight to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites this warning of God. Now, some people will say, you know, this is, this is a fish story. This is a fish tale. 
And this is one reason why I question uh, the, the reliability and the truth of the Scriptures. How in the world could someone live in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights and survive and be vomited back up on land and be able then to, to do this, this mission work that he was assigned to do? And so a lot of people poo-poo the story of Jonah. They dismiss it. But there's a problem for us as Christians. If we dismiss the story of Jonah, we must also dismiss the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? If we say the story of Jonah is a fable and it really didn't happen, then what do we do with Jesus? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 12. Some Pharisees and some teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Folks, if we say that Jonah was a fairy tale. What do we do with the fact that when people demanded some sign from God to show them that Jesus was legitimate, that He was the Son of God, that He was on God's mission, what do we do with the fact that the only sign Jesus gave was the sign of Jonah? Here's your sign. You want a sign, here it is. Jonah was saved in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And then he came back. And the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days. And I will come back. If we discount the story of Jonah, we have to discount the resurrection of Jesus. They are inseparably tied together. And so, let's understand that, that uh, we can learn from Jonah. One of the things we can learn is how to pray and how to obey. Jonah prayed when he was in the belly of that fish. You bet that he prayed. And he prayed earnestly. He prayed like he never had before. He submitted himself to God. He started making sense of what he wanted to do versus what God wanted him to do. And Jonah learned sometimes God gives us all second chances to do His will. In Jonah 1.3, Jonah was commissioned to go to the Ninevites. In Jonah 3.1, after he was spewed back up on land, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Go to Nineveh. He was given a chance, a second chance. The mission hadn't changed, but Jonah had. At least he changed to some degree. He knew that he needed to go to Nineveh. He needed to deliver the message. Now, we can learn that the Word of God is quick, and we can learn that the Word of God is powerful, and we can learn that the Word of God can change anyone's life. Jonah preached the message of condemnation. All we're given is just a couple of sentences that he said. It's like he walked into the city, preached what God told him he had to preach to these, his arch enemies, and then he expected to see them all turn into toast. He expected them all to burn. But that didn't happen. With Jonah's short message of repentance, of coming back to God, the Ninevites, every one of them, all the way from the the smallest and the most insignificant up to the king himself, repented and turned to the God of Israel. Here's the thing. If a message of condemnation preached by by an unsympathetic prophet can change a wicked people like the people of Nineveh, then God's message can change any of us. God's message can change us. It can make us new people. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. What a life-changing revival. God had touched everyone in that city. From the king down. They were humbled. And they were brought to repentance. And God relented. He said, you've listened. I will withhold the condemnation. I will withhold the judgment that was in store for you. You have come to me. He decided to spare them. And for about 200 years, the Ninevites continued to live peacefully. We can learn that God's love is much greater than our love. Now, Jonah preached the message 
And Jonah said, you're going to be destroyed. And he probably was wringing his hands with glee, saying, you're not going to repent, so you're going to be destroyed. But instead, they repented. And then Jonah himself started a pout. He started being upset. In Jonah 4.4, it says, the Lord replied, "Why why is it right for you to be angry? Jonah was upset. These are my enemies. They want to destroy my people. You sent me to them, and I thought they would not listen, and they'd burn. Instead, they've repented. Oh, come on, God. That's not what I had in mind. But it's what God had in mind. God was upset. I'm sorry, Jonah was upset at God's goodness because what he really wanted to see was for his enemies to be destroyed forever, to never be a threat to him and his nation ever again. And God taught him a lesson that we all need to learn. God said, I will do what's right. I will do what's best. And I'll do it in accordance with holiness and with righteousness and with love. And so that's the story of Jonah. That's Jonah, a story of mercy. But then we get to Nahum. And Nahum is the prophet who proclaimed God's justice. Uh, At the same time that the prophets uh, Jeremiah and Zephaniah were uh, pronouncing judgment on the nation of Judah, on God's people, Nahum was given the command to pronounce judgment on one of its arch enemies. Nahum means consolation. And his name, Consolation, is symbolical of the message of the book, which was intended to comfort those who were oppressed and those who were afflicted by their enemies. There's going to be some consolation because those who are entirely evil from their heart all the way out to the tips of their fingers are going to have to pay for their crime. His message is usually dated around 630 to 612 B.C. So if we do a little bit of quick math, we realize that 150 years or so had transpired from the time that Jonah first preached this message of repentance and the people repented. And they changed their ways. 150 years later, the people forgot all about that. This was a new generation. They didn't have this connection with Jonah. They hadn't seen this guy erped up from a fish coming to them to preach the gospel or preach the news of God. And so they had no connection and they had gone back to their old ways. And Nineveh was about to fall. That's the message of Nahum. In, in chapter 1, Nineveh's, Nineveh's doom was declared. God's vengeance was exhibited. Even though he's slow to anger, God is still one who is going to act justly. The goodness of the Lord is described along with the promise of Him to pursue His enemies. In Nahum chapter 2, well, let's back up just a little bit more and talk about Nahum 1. There was a complete overthrow of Nineveh that was predicted. She, when, when she, the city of Nineveh, would be destroyed, she would never afflict anyone again. Despite any plots, she would not be effective. Judah would be delivered from Nineveh's affliction. Nineveh's destruction would, uh, was going to be coming from the command of God Himself. And there would be good tidings. There would be celebrations in Judah. And Judah would be able to return and keep its feasts because its enemy was gone. In chapter 2, Nineveh's doom is described. And and the description, I I, I want us to turn to to Nahum chapter 2 and look at this because this is rather complete. This is very graphic. The description of of, uh, Nineveh's doom in uh, Nahum chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard your fortress. Watch the road. Brace yourselves. Marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines, the shields and his soldiers are red. The warriors are clad in scarlet. The metal of, on their chariots flash. And the day they are made, on the day they are made ready, the spears of pine are brandished. The chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the square. The looking like flaming torches, they dart about like lightning. It's a really kind of a terrible description of what would happen when Nineveh would meet its doom. Now, that doom is described as being so complete that resistance would be futile. 
You can't resist this. I'm reminded of Star Trek and the Borg. Anyone remember the Borg and Star Trek? And the phrase that they constantly used, resistance is futile. Of course, there was a way to come out of that. And, uh, and the good one, eventually, in, in the Star Trek saga. But here for Nineveh, they would resist and that resistance would destroy them. The, the Babylonian Chronicles tell us this. It says that Nineveh fell because the flooding rivers made breaches in the city's defenses. And that's the same thing that, that chapter 2, verse 6 says. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. The prediction was made and the truth came. Such a h- horrendous flood filled the city that the city could never rebuild. There was a sacking of the city. Her inhabitants would flee. The city would be plundered. Her destruction would be complete. Nineveh was, would be no more. It would be wiped clean. Nineveh's doom, we're told in chapter 3, is deserved. It's deserved because of her sins. It's deserved because she was no better than the ancient Egyptian city of, of Noamon, which is also named Thebes in the Greek. And uh, despite the strength of this ancient Egyptian city, the city was wiped away. And the Ninevites also were taken away. Her strength and her wealth would not save her. Her strongholds would fail. All her efforts, all her wealth, all her army could not resist the approaching doom. Now, isn't this such a lovely sermon to, to, to think about on the first Sunday of February? The, the month of love, the month of Valentine's Day, and we're talking about doom and condemnation. We're talking about the fact that people who totally and utterly reject the Lord are going to have to face the fact that their end comes. None of his leaders would be dead, the people would be scattered, and those who were enemies of Nineveh would be rejoicing because Nineveh was gone. Now, Jonah tells us a message of mercy. Nahum tells us a message of judgment. What's that got to do with us? Why am I bothering to spend this much time this morning telling you these things and what's in these books? Here's what it boils down to, folks. Countries are in a mess because their people are in a mess. Countries are in a mess because their people are in a mess. The message of Nahum reminds us of the words of Paul from Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Paul said, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in, the, in His kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Don't think for a minute that because we call ourselves Christians... That just wearing the name and going through the motions is going to make any difference. It's what goes on in the heart. It's what happens inside. We need to continue in God's goodness. Lest we too experience the severity of God. We need to understand that if if we think our country is in a mess, it's because individuals in the country are in a mess. They don't have a commitment to God. When people disregard God, and when they disregard God's desires, when they choose to go their own way, what happens in their homeland simply reflects what is happening in godless hearts. I can't say this enough. Politics cannot save. Politics cannot save. Only Christ's love, only Christ's mercy, and only His transforming power can save. And if we think the country is going the wrong way, it's because the people of the country have forgotten the mercy of God. And it's time for us individually, one-on-one, heart to God, To make a commitment. It starts here. It starts in this service. That we would come back to the one who saves us. Here's the invitation this morning. God loves us. He loves us no matter who we are. 
He loves us no matter what we have done. He wants to forgive us and He will forgive us. But we need to respond. We need to hear His Word. We need to repent like the Ninevites did in Jonah's day and turn to God. And we need to obey Him. That's the message. That's the message of Jonah and that's the message of Nahum. Repent. Come back to the One who loves you, who has made provision for you, who cares for you, who is preparing a place for you forever. Repent. If life is difficult, sometimes it's difficult because we just are not living for God. If our nation is having difficulties, it's enduring these difficulties because as a people, we are not living for God. God calls individuals and He calls whole nations to repentance. But it starts in this heart. Here. And then it grows from there. If you're having problems, if you're dealing with struggles in your life, if you don't know why things aren't working out, could it be that God is not on the throne of your heart? Could it be that you do not allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in you and through you? Could it be that you know what you ought to do, but you have never surrendered yourself so completely to God that He has all control? He invites you to repent and to come to Him and to start fresh. And you can do that today. If you're outside of the love of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come. Even as we sing this song, wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, we'll find out where you're at. We'll, we'll, we'll share with you what God's Word says need, you need to do in that growth so that there's real repentance and there's a real turnaround, not only in our, in our hearts, but in our community. And dare we say, even in this country, it starts here. And it can start today. Would you make that decision? Let's stand together and let's sing this song.